Well, welcome to Startup Grind Chilliwack. We're thrilled to be rebooting it here at Cowork Chilliwack. If you're not aware, it's a global movement. There's more than 400 chapters worldwide, and I've actually been as a director on these calls with others kickstarting in Peru and Bangladesh, and it's been pretty cool to learn about this network. And really, it's threefold. It's all about educating, inspiring, and connecting. And it's three things. Give first, don't take. Make friends, not contacts. Help others before yourself. And we've really started to build this startup ecosystem in Chilliwack, and we're hoping that this can be a monthly get-together where there could be connections and, and so forth. So we're pretty excited. Right off the bat, we've got two key sponsors. I leaned on some connections, and Nettie Tam from SEPCO, Chilliwack Economic Partners, has signed up to sponsor this for 2019, as has the University of the Fraser Valley. So we're starting small, but it's going to grow on a monthly basis. And our partners, my two companies, Cowork Chilliwack and Currency Marketing, and Wisebox are involved at the director level. Not only is uh, Colin our first interview, he's also agreed to be a co-director of Startup Grind Chilliwack. So more the merrier. Uh, if you are taking pictures, use the, the hashtag Startup Grind and post those to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, etc. And those will be part of the global startup. And without further ado, I would like to announce and invite Colin Schmidt. He's the CEO of Wisebox Solutions to the stage. Everybody, get on your feet and give him a round of applause. And come on up, Colin. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Tim. I'll put you in the hot seat here. And we have not rehearsed this. This is going to be a free-form conversation. I know Colin for a few years now and, and know a bit about his story but I'm hoping that we'll really get to the, the bottom of what makes you tick and why you're, who you are and where you, why you've arrived here. So if we roll back the clock a little bit, uh, where were you born? Chilliwack, right here, haven't left. Cool. And you have an interesting past in that you were involved in a, let's say, not mainstream sport. Can you describe that? Certainly. Uh, equestrian vaulting is uh, gymnastics on horseback. So uh, to be clear, we're not talking about the horse uh, doing some dance stuff, uh, which is dressage, uh, but we're talking about the horses actually running in a circle, and you're actually going to run up to the horse, and you're going to jump up onto the horse's back and do a gymnastics routine on the horse's back. So it's called equestrian vaulting. Uh, it's one of uh, the seven uh, FEI, International Equestrian Federation disciplines, uh, that are part of the World Equestrian Games. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, actually fairly mainstream, uh, like in Germany, for example, they have as many vaulters as we have riders. But uh, out here, of course, it's not as well known. So I, I got into that uh, at a young age, uh, 11, and uh, competed internationally for Canada from 1995 through 2010, actually. So let's back up a second. Mainstream soccer, hockey, like how do you get involved in equestrian vaulting? Yeah, Chilliwack is the answer to that. Okay. Uh, the oldest club in Canada is actually here in Chilliwack. It was actually started in the mid-60s. Uh, so I grew up uh, with uh, equestrian background. Uh, I had a first pony when I was nine. So getting involved in 4-H and those sorts of things, you're going to come across it if you're in town here. And uh, sure enough, we did. And uh, myself and my siblings all signed up at the same time. And uh, that's that. So what did that teach you just from a um, personal standpoint? A uh, tremendous uh, opportunity there, really. Uh, I have to say that uh, on the personal development side, uh, the sports psychology, uh, the ability to basically go into the international stage uh, definitely is the underdog. Uh, and in many situations. Uh, if you're competing in Europe, what happens is they're competing on their own horses. Uh, they train on the horse, they take their horse to the competition, and then they get to compete on a horse they're familiar with. As a North American, especially back in those days, uh, what happens is you show up and you have a week or two uh, in Europe to get used to the horse you're going to compete on. And then you're going to run into that world championships on a horse that you've had maybe uh, eight or 12 practices on, uh, competing against uh, the uh, people who have the home turf. So uh, uh, you're certainly in, a, in an underdog position. And to run into the competition ring and uh, give it your best uh, and leave it all there and uh, to uh, do so... Uh, with the confidence that uh, you're able to do your best uh, is uh, something that uh, takes, uh, uh, s let's say, some practice. Uh, and uh, it's a great opportunity to work through a lot of things that you can uh, take off, um, I guess, learn the benefits of in business later on. Hmm. 
So in parallel to that, growing up, did you have an entrepreneurial bug? Yeah, for sure. The family did, really. Uh, we uh, Basically, we had Charlie Horse Ranch was the family business. Uh, so we did kids' birthday parties and pony rides, summer day camps, and those sorts of things. Uh, and uh, what basically, uh, in there, you get uh, to understand the basics of business. Uh, we started that business when I was probably 11 or 12. Uh, by the time I was 16, I basically was taking care of bookings and uh, actually organizing a lot of the day-to-day uh, -day aspects of the business. Hmm. So tech, where did that come from? Like, when did you get involved in technology? Yeah, people often comment that uh, horses and computers are kind of an odd mix for a lifestyle. And uh, so sitting there up on the eastern hillsides of Chilliwack on this little horse ranch, uh, but my mom was a freelance writer. She uh, wrote for Country Life. And uh, being a freelance writer, even back in those days, she ended up with a one of the first uh, personal computers, per se. Uh, in this case, it was a, a Coco 2. Uh, and uh, having that in the household uh, in that era uh, with that boots up into nothing other than a uh, basic interpreter uh, exposes you to some code when you're four or five years old. And so uh, we're playing uh, little games on that, seeing the code and uh, tweaking with it and playing with it. And uh, that just kind of set the spark. Uh, mm -hmm. By the time I was uh, eight, I just, or sorry, in grade eight, decided to uh, teach myself how to program for real. Uh, went to the library, got a bunch of books on Fortran, COBOL, BASIC, <laughs> and uh, taught myself to program and started to write my first applications. Describe some of those applications. Sure. Uh, well, of course, horses and computers. So my first commercial application that I wrote was uh, scoring software for equestrian vaulting. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of numbers that go into uh, the scores. Uh, to sit there with a tape calculator back in those days in the mid-90s uh, to do the scoring uh, was very tedious. Uh, so uh, some of the other coaches around uh, who uh, knew of my computer interest basically uh, told my mom, you need to get Colin to write a program for this. So uh, I had my uh, first real version of that scoring software in 1995 written in MS-DOS. And uh, we uh, used that uh, for a number of years. Uh, and then later on, an interesting story is decided to make the first international version of this uh, so that I could uh, have my first commercial product and uh, sell it to uh, other countries and whatnot. So in 1998, I made the international version. It was in Microsoft Windows instead of in DOS and uh, put great effort into making sure that the database structure would allow you to customize what the rules were. So different countries could easily tweak the rules in the software to uh, not have me have to write one version of the software for each country in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, uh, this was going to be my first real business venture, of course, uh, beyond the family business. And uh, I succeeded in selling exactly one copy of it to someone who then reverse engineered my database structure and then sold that database structure in a web interface uh, to uh, another country. Wow. <laughs> so that was uh, one of my first uh, early uh, entrepreneurial uh, learnings is uh, uh, what intellectual property is worth and uh, how uh, playing play, plays in the market are going to uh, ruin you pretty quickly, uh, as well as uh, realistically, uh, I guess, a reality check that uh, business is more complicated than write a good piece of software. So when that happened, did you pursue any legal or did you just say, I guess this is the way it works? Or uh, No, I, I, at that point I was 20 years old, uh, just starting university. I, had, I honestly had no clue about that. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> so you mentioned university. Where did you go to university? Uh, university of the Fraser Valley. Of course, at that time, it was UCFE is still. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, went there, uh, uh, signed up for the uh, cooperative education program aspect on top of the computer information systems. Uh, so I did co-op uh, work terms, uh, first of all, for Border Customs uh, that was uh, part of CRA at the time. And uh, there did uh, on-site IT work as well as uh, prototyped uh, the software that tax as you as you come across the border uh, and pay your duties. So uh, if you're ever doing that, uh, you have me to thank for prototyping that. <laughs> After that, went and worked for Corrections Canada uh, and uh, I did a co-op term there, followed by a general contract, actually, uh, working at uh, uh, one prison in Abbotsford and then later in Mission. Hmm. So what age are we talking about? I guess we're talking, uh, well, I left uh, Corrections uh, to uh, start my own uh, Really, I had started the business already in 1998, 
uh, but I left uh, corrections to do that full time in 1999, just before the uh, Y2K bug. So I was in there uh, fixing up stuff for Y2K, of course, uh, but uh, I left uh, just before Y2K. And uh, it's kind of an interesting feeling, actually, because some people will say when you're leaving your job and you're going to start a new business, you feel so free. But uh, as I was doing that, I was walking out of prison gates. So it had a nice, <laughs> had a nice imagery to it. Hmm. <laughs> So describe that first business. Did you just roll into it? Were you doing it on the side? Did you have like a formal business plan? Did you take out loans? Like what did that look like? Sure. Uh, well, Horse Council of British Columbia basically had a database project blow up on them in 1998. Uh, they uh, needed something fairly complex uh, to deal with their membership that was uh, growing rapidly. A lot of data entry on many different computers uh, and different aspects of the organization beyond just membership to keep track of. Uh, so that project blew up on them. Uh, they were familiar with my athlete profile and where I was going to school and what I was studying. So they brought me in to have a look at uh, their failed projects and what we could do to, uh, going forwards. Uh, they also, uh, beyond just bringing some college students who they had a, a <laughs> I guess, a competitive uh, relationship with, uh, they also brought in Microsoft and Oracle to uh, give them quotes on this system. Uh, those quotes came in at over a million dollars each. Mm. Um, and they had me on the other side, and I'm going, well, learning what I am in school, it's uh, kind of clear that, yeah, well, what you did in Access, that was kind of the cheap way to do it, and it blew up. Uh, it can't scale the way you need it to. Uh, yes, I can see from what I'm learning in school that building this out properly in these systems is going to be a lot of work. So I basically set them up with a real, uh, basically a bit of a crutch system to limp by on uh, that was kind of a best fit uh, and limited to them doing data entry for certain sections of the uh, organization on just one computer each uh, to prevent uh, corruption across the network in that access database. From there, though, I said, hey, well, I'm going to build you a system. So uh, that basically was the beginnings of the spark for what became moxie.build. Hmm. Uh, so did four years of research and development uh, from 1998 through 2002, and then Horse Council BC went live with version 1.0 of it in 2003. So talk about the business arrangement there. It sounds like a monster client representing a great deal of your business. Mm -hmm. Did you have the foresight to talk about licensing or was this just a work for hire project or how did that work? Yeah, uh, licensing was definitely clear from the beginning that I was going to build the IP myself. Uh, they, uh, they did uh, pay to have their uh, IP of basically on top of their customized version of the software. But uh, that was something that we later actually open sourced basically across the provinces so that the other provinces could benefit. So basically we had an open source project of each of the provinces across the country contributing uh, to the software that was written on top of the underlying platform and the platform's IP is owned by my company. Hmm. And at the time, you're talking about we, but how how many, what is we? Is sure. That, is that we, just we, you? No, or is not that... just me in those days. I was the only one doing coding on the platform. Okay. Uh, in order to pay the bills, because you can imagine that uh, writing this platform is going to take a bit of effort and you've got to eat somehow, right? Uh, so along the way, we had uh, actually a couple side projects. Uh, but mostly what it was is that we were doing on-site tech support for businesses. Okay. So that aspect of the business uh, grew out of necessity. It was easy to do, uh, and uh, that uh, was something that paid the bills for many years, actually. Uh, the time, it was uh, in 2015, is actually when I sold that half of the company to the person who was managing it at the time, uh, Daniel Spence. So Spence Tech uh, mm -hmm. is the uh, offshoot acquired version of, uh, was the IT support side of the company all through those years. And that transaction happened when we had finally gotten the software revenue up to be equal to the uh, software, sorry, the software revenue to be equal to the uh, tech support revenue. Hmm. And in your mind, in those early days, did you always have the vision of, okay, we're going to pick one of these and I want it to be the software and this other exactly. side is just a means to an end? Correct, yeah. Talk about that, kind of trying to balance these two, because it sounds like it was a very smart move, right, that you were able to do this still generate a living. Did you have any investing investments at this time, or investors, rather? 
Uh, no, we had tried one side project with some investors, uh, and uh, this is just an interesting side story. Uh, the name of the company was Macrosense. Uh, we had some new legislation coming in at the time about privacy laws. And uh, the implications of this is that you weren't able to transmit your customer data in plain text. So a lawyer communicating with a customer with sensitive data uh, would have to actually have some security behind that. Uh, today's internet protocols on the email side are secure. Uh, there's encryption behind your email. Back then, there wasn't. So uh, myself uh, and uh, a partner company, as well as numerous other companies throughout Canada, basically said, OK, we need to have some secure document transfer software for lawyers. Uh, so we set out to build that application um, as a side project not related to my platform. And uh, we actually succeeded in building a, a quality product that uh, the largest uh, supplier to the legal industry at the time anyways, uh, Diane Durham, uh, they basically had built their own product uh, and they saw ours and they actually ditched their own product and decided to resell our product. Hmm. Um, so uh, at that point, uh, we, I, myself and four other people involved in this company certainly believed we had it made. Um, unfortunately, what happened is that not a single lawyer believed that their client would sue them for not using such software. <laughs> and the, zeros the, the sales really amounted to zero. Hmm. Uh, so it was one of those cases of uh, you, you think the uh, market conditions are just right. Uh, it was definitely a business learning experience uh, for myself and many others. Uh, there were many failed companies with the same business plan as ours at the time. Hmm. And that's back in the day. Was that like box software or was this hosted... SaaS software? Or? Yeah, this was actually hosted SaaS software. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so you touch on something that you've probably learned a lot about now, this whole notion of product market fit. <laughs> um, how did you, this software for the, the legal industry, were you just going on a hunch that, that it would be needed or did you have some advisors pushing yeah. you to do it? Uh, other business partners involved uh, had uh, connections into large law firms in Vancouver. Um, and... Uh, the conversation started around the water cooler, of course, where, hey, we understand you need this, and yes, somebody says we need it, and uh, you believe you have market validation from these water cooler conversations. It's a different thing altogether when you ask them to actually write the check. Hmm. Hmm. So fast forward, we're now sort of mid-2000s. Um, the equestrian side is going strong and Moxie Build, you, you touched on that, but what is that? Okay. Moxie.Build is a web development platform. Uh, so it's the whole stack. You have the database, the web server, the runtime environment, the content management system, its own programming language, all in one single program. So uh, the advantage here is basically no inter-process communication, meaning you don't have the web server talking to the language, talking to the database, et cetera. Uh, so that allows you to basically have faster access to the data. You're not moving as much data around. And it also has some security implications because a lot of the security holes that uh, can be found in these stacks is going to be between the different processes. So Moxie.Build allows us to write basically less code uh, and uh, code that typically is higher performing uh, for scalability and uh, allows us to keep the maintenance costs and the hosting costs and everything down in comparison. So uh, it is something that's evolved, obviously, over 20 years and has a lot of research and development into it at this point. Hmm. Um, not to get too technical, but what is the underlying platform? Like, I know you're a big Microsoft <laughs> guy. <laughs> well, uh, for sure, I guess uh, I, I grew up with uh, Microsoft Quick Basic uh, on a Tandy 1000 after the Coco 2. So <laughs> definitely have Microsoft roots there uh, and uh, grew into the early versions of uh, Moxie.build were actually client server desktop software. Uh, so version three was the first web version, but versions one and two were client server on the desktop. And of course, desktop in that era is Microsoft Windows. So yeah. uh, if that's where you get your code base uh, and you have that much invested into it, you're going to continue that trend. Mm -hmm. Have you, you mentioned open source and, and diving into that, or is it still primarily all Microsoft, or is it some Linux stuff too? Yeah, so to be clear on the Microsoft side, basically, uh, Moxie.Build runs on top of a Microsoft Windows server, okay? Uh, but it's just the server 
OS period, and the rest of the stack is just moxie.build. Hmm. Uh, however, the stack that I'm referring to is all server side. Uh, everything client side is open source. So it comes with basically a, a good cohesive package of all of the tools you need for the uh, client side interface. Uh, we're talking Bootstrap uh, version 3, the last version of it uh, in production, of course, uh, along with jQuery and a handful of different components, user interface components, that are all carefully put together for you and maintained together such that when you update the one thing, moxie.build, you have everything already cohesive and working together. Hmm. So I know there was a, I'm not totally clear on it, but there was a shift in your thinking along the way from I'm going to bootstrap, self-fund this, to I want to get involved in the rapid development growth company. And I know you've been involved in some groups. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that? Kind of Certainly. what, what was the, where did you go and why did you go? Yeah. So let's uh, start off with talking about uh, the dark ages. So after uh, the MacroSense uh, failure, um, it was, okay, I'm going to refocus in on moxie.build and grow this. Uh, so I was certainly growing some clients, but the truth is it was easy to have clients lined up the door just as referrals coming from our existing work. What I couldn't have out here in the valley was actually the ability to easily hire. Mm -hmm. uh, I, at that point in time, I had uh, previously lived out of my office for a number of years, and eventually it's like, okay, I'd rather work from home in a house than actually live in an office. So when I made that switch, I became a home business for a while. And uh, running a home business out here in the valley and looking to hire while growing a company was a tough, uh, was a tough run. Uh, so it was clear that in order to grow the company, uh, I need to be able to hire and I was stuck there. So I went to uh, Ace Tech, which is a, a, a CEO uh, program in Vancouver, 150 CEOs uh, membership based, and they have their growth strategies program as well as a round table program where on a monthly basis, uh, you and uh, eight to 10 other CEOs are actually discussing your businesses with each other. Um, and then of course they have their wonderful uh, once per year Whistler Summit as well, uh, which is uh, just phenomenal. Uh, but in these round tables uh, discussions month after month, uh, I was there to learn and uh, learn I did. Uh, the biggest takeaway that I had from those uh, over time was that someone asked a hiring question and the answer that uh, the person received was clearly my problem. It's like, if you aren't the coolest place to work, then you're not going to be able to hire. So uh, with that reflecting, it's like, okay, fine. Um, I, nobody wants to work for the home business. I need to go get an office. So the downtown business center near Five Corners um, went and took a look at that, fell in love with the top corner suites looking out over Five Corners. And went, okay, this will be the office. Um, and then step two is like, okay, I had all of the branding of the company was fairly corporate and trying to, we're a serious company. Uh, but meanwhile, um, that wasn't the flavor that uh, the college students that I would rather have uh, as uh, new hires uh, would be looking for. So rebranded the company to really be a lot more, um, let's say, friendly, uh, looking less corporate. Uh, and uh, hey, we're a small, hip little startup, uh, and uh, come work with us. This is our attitude as opposed to trying to be some big corporate entity we're not. So those changes worked out quite well. I, it's uh, became a lot easier to hire uh, co-op students uh, and a lot easier to hire other uh, uh, other people uh, in the who are just in Chilliwack anyways. Uh, all of a sudden, we had a presence. But that presence got magnified, really, because it was clear that you can't live in isolation. Um, it, it was very clear just looking at different tech ecosystems around the world that uh, it basically it continues to thrive the more dense it gets. So I'm going, okay, well, where's the rest of the tech <laughs> industry here in town? How do I find them? How do we actually kind of raise the profile of this? Because it became quite clear that uh, many of the people who worked in Chilliwack in the tech industry were all commuting. And the reason they were commuting is in their impression, there was no jobs here. So if that's their impression, they're not even looking at the job ads. They're not it's just not on their radar. So how can we build a bunch of buzz about the tech industry? Uh, and it would not, of course, uh, benefit just my company, but it would benefit the rest of the tech companies in town. Uh, so that was the beginning of Chilliwack.tech. Uh, so I started off uh, with just the connections I had to bringing the uh, tech uh, industry people together just once a month for a monthly tech meetup. Hmm. And uh, that, those discussions helped us formulate what are the first events we should run. And we started with the uh, first uh, hackathon, 
uh, in uh, March of uh, 2017. And uh, it was really a, a quite a successful first event. We had 16 uh, participants showed up, uh, ended up with four or five teams, uh, and uh, had the first winning team actually create a new company. Uh, so Maple Space Incorporated is a little software company here in the Valley still, uh, and growing, and with our clientele. And uh, we created that out of the first hackathon. Hmm. Uh, we got a lot of good buzz and PR out of that. Uh, but it was clear from the first participants that we really had a very narrow focus on uh, basically mobile-friendly web apps, the same sort of stuff we do. But it was like, hey, we need to diversify uh, what we're seeing at the hackathon. So that led to the Slash Next event. And uh, that's uh, in the uh, fall of uh, 2017. Uh, then was uh, our first education-focused theme. We had uh, three different topics. Uh, we were talking about uh, cryptocurrencies, artificial intelligence, and Internet of Things. Um, and that created uh, more buzz as well and got more people interested in the next hackathon. Uh, so our hackathon in uh, this year, 2018, had doubled the participation, 18, so, uh, sorry, 32 participants. Uh, we created yet another new company, uh, basically. Uh, they were just getting started, but uh, they uh, got a real good push at the hackathon, and they're in business today. Uh, they're a gaming company, uh, and uh, so showing some diversification. We had lots of people working on artificial intelligence uh, aspects uh, to their uh, hacks this past year. And uh, again, we just kind of uh, solidified the, um, the format of what that startup hackathon should be. And then this year, we had our Slash Next event, of course, just this past uh, Sunday. And uh, uh, we decided that we needed to go a little bit more techy. Uh, so we upped the uh, level of uh, sophistication of the talks a little bit uh, to make them a little bit more detailed. But we also made them shorter. We compressed them from uh, like 50-minute talks down to just half an hour. And we got five of them in there. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a real... Uh, uh, it was uh, some members or uh, some of the people who showed up said, I felt like I was drinking from a fire hose, and that was exactly what our goal was. Mm -hmm. So uh, getting that uh, yeah, that event uh, leading into next year's hackathon is helping to grow the community, and the more the community grows, the better it's going to be for every tech industry participant. That was a long answer. <laughs> that it was. <laughs> <That> was <laughs> You're very easy to interview. Just get them started. But let's roll back a little bit. You said, I went to Ace Tech. Sure. What was involved in going to Ace Tech? Was it an application? Did you find it online? Was there an interview process? How does that work? Hmm. Yeah. Well, they actually will uh, interview you. Uh, you basically have to meet their criteria. They have to think that you're a fit for the organization. Uh, and uh, that's important uh, that they are going to fill these round tables actually with people that they believe are uh, committed uh, to actually growing the company in the first place and that uh, they're there to learn and don't show up thinking they have all the answers. And is there some minimum level, um, some requirements from the company standpoint? Yeah, sure. Uh, Ace Tech is not a uh, venture accelerator. Uh, it's actually definitely focused on growth companies. Uh, so you definitely have to be in the revenue. Uh, and uh, I'd say that in the smaller participants, you you need to be at least half a million of revenue uh, before you go there. Uh, and uh, they have companies there in the upper end that uh, are certainly uh, in the hundreds of millions of revenue. Hmm. And so that was in Vancouver. Your meetings were in Vancouver? Yes. And talk to me about what's going on in Mission and Abbotsford, because something else was forming around that time. Yeah, for sure. So we have uh, SRC Tech has uh, quite the history here in the Valley, um, the SUMAS Regional Consortium for High Tech, and they have uh, recently renamed themselves to Accelerator. Uh, so SRC Tech uh, at the time uh, basically had uh, in partnership with uh, Innovate BC, uh, basically the Venture Accelerator Program. And uh, I actually went through that program and um, uh, tried it out with a uh, program named Stable Buzz, which is a uh, stable management SaaS solution for the equestrian riding community. And so going through that process, uh, it actually then uh, made it clear that yes, uh, this is a valid market, uh, and no, I couldn't afford to build it. <laughs> so going along for many years, kind of on your own, figuring it out, and now diving deep into almost like adult education, right? And, and being amongst peers, was that, was that like a light bulb moment? Or was it more a gradual 
okay, I feel something changing in me and my business. Yeah, I would say there were many individual light bulb moments along the way, but uh, it certainly is a very gradual process. Uh, it's uh, one of the things is actually just learning to speak the same language. Ace Tech uh, has basically invested heavily in um, following the uh, growth strategy tools of uh, the Gazelle system. Uh, so we're talking about one page strategic plan and all of the terminology in there. Uh, everybody, in order to have a useful conversation around the round table, you have to speak the same language. There's many different uh, systems out there and uh, different terms for different business ideas. Uh, but if you're all using different terms, it's kind of hard to have a, a good conversation about these things in a really impactful, tight time period. Hmm. I'm just cognizant of time. Yeah, we're doing pretty good. So let's shift to rapid growth, being involved in these groups, and somehow just boom, you're acquired. <laughs> Was that in the master plan, or were you hoping to, to get some investors and kind of grow? Like, Talk to me about that whole thing that went down. Sure. Interesting. Uh, so I would say it was in the plan, but it happened sooner than expected um, is definitely the uh, honest answer. Uh, so on the growth side, it's like, okay, I have more business than I had staff for. So grow the staff. Uh, and now the business is continuing to just grow at a fairly decent pace. But uh, pretty quick, uh, I'm sitting here uh, running hackathons uh, and um, trying to build a startup culture. And uh, so just doing a service business is one thing. To have your own products out there is another. So to be able to morph the company from a service company to a product company is not simple. Uh, and of course, it means that you're going to have to take profit from the service company and invest that into the new products. So uh, we were investing heavily in the new products along the way. Uh, and uh, you know, we had uh, basically a fintech uh, uh, offshoot that we're looking at uh, launching that uh, we'll be able to talk more about in the near future. But uh, that fintech product uh, was uh, a great business opportunity uh, and uh, investing in it uh, was uh, to get it to market was uh, a heavy lift. So uh, at the time that we were getting near to market for that product, uh, it was clear that we could uh, basically slow down development uh, and take a longer time to get to market or we could basically look for investment in that uh, product uh, and uh, continue development at the fast rate that we wanted to complete it in. We also had the stable management software I'd mentioned that we had done the market validation on, um, as well as wanting to make a pure software as a service version of our membership management system that was our grassroots. So it, all of those things collectively is a lot of heavy lift. And so it was like, okay, we could continue some slow growth after this, uh, or we could uh, basically take on our first uh, real investment and uh, grow up a bit faster. And so that investment, was it, did it start as just a, like a seed round or an angel round? How does, <laughs> what does that look like? You hear series A and B and C, like, did you follow those at all? Or was it just, uh, like, can you talk a little bit about what that looks like? Certainly. Um, I would say that in the real world, there's a lot of misconception about uh, investment uh, in startup companies, uh, primarily because, sure, there is perhaps a certain typical way that it is done uh, in certain areas of the world. Uh, but uh, the reality is it's a lot more to do with relationships uh, than it is to do with having the best idea and coming up with someone who has more money than they know what to do with and getting lucky. Um, so that's not the approach that we're taking here, obviously, uh, in the Fraser Valley. Uh, we're looking at establishing good relationships, uh, understanding each other, and seeing uh, some good core connections on the values. Uh, so, uh, of course, our acquirer uh, is iOpen Technologies. And iOpen Technologies, of course, uh, is one of the companies who has been sponsoring and uh, helping out with SRC Tech, which became Accelerator. So our shared community work was something that we could talk about, uh, get to know each other uh, through that community work, of course, and just gave opportunities for conversations that uh, wouldn't necessarily have happened otherwise. Hmm. And so really by, because I first became aware of you probably three years ago now, and it was this whole notion of building a startup community, and and you really kind of came on the scene, and it was very altruistic in a sense, 
but also to serve your own purpose of trying to grow your your company. And and here we are. It's really come full circle. Um, how long ago was the acquisition? I started. Uh, the acquisition was official on uh, July first. Okay. Uh, so uh, of course uh, December will be five months. Yeah. Uh, and. Um, it's uh, it certainly once we decided that we were going to do it, we did it very quickly. So how has life changed? The private jets, <laughs> the the waking up and walking into the office at ten a.m. and has anything changed? Or oh yes, lots have changed, uh, and uh, all for the better uh, in many ways. We have uh, simply just more resources than uh, it would have taken. Uh, it would have taken some years to get the resources we have now when you just consider people, bodies in certain roles that you wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, administrative assistants, uh, HR departments, uh, the accounting department, the marketing department, the sales department, to have that stuff just all of a sudden there uh, is uh, tremendous. Uh, as opposed to uh, going through the learning experience besides the expense of actually trial and error of, uh, okay, so you're a young founder and you have uh, your desire to get your first salesperson and you yourself have done sales. It's easy for you to talk about sales of your products. You know it, but do you actually know how to bring up a sales team and build a sales team, right? Uh, so you've got to consider as a founder, what is your skill set? Uh, and my skill set, I would say, on the founding side of the company and on the tech side of the company, uh, very good. Uh, but on actually building an organization to the size that I wish to build it without outside mentorship um, is, uh, let's just say, I would n not like to make a failure out of the first company. Hmm. So I opened Technologies, acquired Knowless Incorporated, and then you rebranded Knowless to Wisebox Solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and you Correct. are you are the CEO of that entity. Correct. And that feeds up to iOpen. Now, does iOpen own other companies, or, or is iOpen, can you talk about the structure of that organization? Sure. Yeah, iOpen uh, owns a few other companies. We are, we're not their first acquisition, and uh, we will certainly not be their last. Um, so uh, that group of companies is able to share resources, uh, both uh, financially as well as uh, just administratively and uh, people in seats in different departments. Uh, so uh, the group of companies, are they're um, really benefiting from a bit of an ecosystem. And beyond that, they actually are able to help each other on various projects. So we have new interest, of course, in uh, making better use of mapping technology in some of our newer products. And that's, uh, of course, the foundation of iOpens technology is geospatial applications. Hmm. Leading up to that, I mean, most entrepreneurs, and you're, you're not in a partnership originally. It's just, well, you were, but then you've been on your own. You're the leader. You're running this, guiding a team. Um, what did that look like? Were you close to the vest? Did you bring your employees on board and, and explain this as an option? Mm. Like, can you speak to that a little bit? Certainly. Um, I can actually tell you that my employees voted in favor of the acquisition, and that was the final decision. Uh, so I actually laid it out for them of what the options were, uh, and uh, uh, but I left the vote actually up to them. Hmm. And did they, and you can say I can't talk about this, but <laughs> was there equity involved for employees or? Uh, no. No, no. Okay. I, I have, yeah, I, on the equity side of things, I believe that equity is a valid reward when the company gets to a certain size. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, before the company is a certain size and we're not there yet, uh, I think it's um, maybe not as uh, honest uh, of a proposition as uh, some people make it out to be. If you realistically don't have the ability to sell those shares, you aren't really giving them something of value yet. Uh, as we, as the company grows and as you start to do future investment rounds, that's where you actually have the ability to, in the future, sell some shares. But today, who's actually going to buy the shares? <laughs> and so that notion a few years back, you're working out of your house and you're thinking you've got the advice, you need to build the cool company to, to bring on the talent. Do you feel like you're there? Do you feel like the, you've now got the cool company or, or, you, or are you going back to more corporate? Um, I would say no, we're, we're definitely not going, uh, let's say 
not corporate in attitude uh, the same way. Uh, we have new processes, honestly, that we were missing that are awesome. Um, just our daily uh, into weekly, into monthly, quarterly cycles, and just uh, some of the administration tools that we've inherited there, uh, uh, the staff really like it, actually. Uh, but uh, as far as being too corporate, uh, we certainly are wanting to be staying with the startup culture, of course, uh, and uh, definitely, definitely looking to be as lean and mean as possible, even as we add more staff. So let's turn it over to the <laughs> audience for some questions. Did anybody have any questions for Colin? Just a question, what is Moxie? So, you mentioned it earlier. Sure. Moxie.build is a web development platform. So if you want to build custom business applications, uh, typically from scratch, uh, then Moxie.build is going to allow you to just get that uh, job done and get your solution out to market a lot faster than uh, competing platforms. So with the acquisition and I open, Moxiebuild.build is still existing. Is it going into other parts of the iOpen group? Yeah, we definitely have a goal of uh, getting a lot more, uh, uh, basically, uh, training going both directions from both teams. Uh, so uh, we're basically just starting the process now of some iOpen staff coming and actually learning more about Moxie.build. Uh, and meanwhile, our staff are then on the other side learning more about their geospatial technology. Hmm. So you've done now two slash next events one or two hackathons, do you see that continuing? Oh, very much so. Uh, we're definitely, uh, the, the community aspect, as I said, was a shared value between both companies already. Uh, so if anything, uh, we're further solidifying that. Uh, and Accelerator and the Chilliwack Tech Group uh, are honestly going to just be working a lot closer together now and uh, are going to uh, make sure that uh, these events are something that just year after year are able to continuously, like a business, grow and learn from uh, past experience and continuously invest in the future. And you were pretty instrumentally early on with the Chilliwack Tech monthly meetings and, and really kind of creating an ecosystem of government, education, entrepreneurs, which I think was a catalyst for SEPCO to get involved and create the Chilliwack Innovation Network. Can you talk about that? Certainly. I'm just really glad that uh, SEPCO actually has the Chilliwack Innovation Network uh, as an official committee at this point. Uh, so it's exciting to uh, see the city actually buy into the vision uh, of what tech can do for the city and that uh, I guess you have to remind everybody that in British Columbia, tech employs uh, and provides money for more families than any other industry. Uh, so uh, is that necessarily true in Chilliwack? Probably not, but it is true for BC as a whole. And uh, so Chilliwack needs to certainly get there. And if we don't have the right people around the table discussing how do we actually grow this industry in Chilliwack and make sure that we take part of the largest industry in the province, uh, then uh, <laughs> it's just not going to happen. So I'm really happy that SEPCO has uh, stepped up to the plate there and uh, is facilitating the Chilliwack Innovation Network meetings uh, and uh, looking forward to working with them on an ongoing basis. Hmm. Recruitment, we touched on that a little bit previously. Um, where are you getting your employees? Are they coming from UFC or are they coming from other institutions? Yeah, uh, at the moment, actually, pretty well every staff person other than uh, one staff person who's been with me for 15 years, uh, all of the current staff uh, are actually UFE students hmm. um, or worse, UFE students and have since graduated. Uh, so uh, half of them have come through co-op and half have not, uh, but uh, they've actually all have a background at UFE. And talk about the the CS program there, is it what it needs to be? Uh, the uh, CIS program there actually now has a complement. Uh, they've recently launched their uh, Bachelor of Computer Sciences as well. Uh, and interestingly enough, they didn't actually shut down the Computer Information Systems degree. Uh, so uh, students can actually choose, uh, do I want to be the more uh, science-focused uh, uh, Bachelor of Computer Sciences uh, that uh, is going to be a little bit more narrow uh, in its focus, or do I want to be more of the general purpose uh, computing studies of uh, computing information systems? 
Uh, one of the things that UFE has done really well the last couple of years is their new coding bridging program. Uh, it's a great way to interface uh, graduating or about to graduate students uh, with the local industry. So it's a one month program that's actually intended to take place after they've graduated, where it's going to introduce them to what are the uh, latest and greatest uh, coding trends uh, that are stuff that, you know, take longer to get that stuff into the curriculum than what they can do in this uh, quick little postgrad course. And then they actually have internships with local uh, tech companies uh, that are going to, they'll be basically uh, at our office, for example, on Thursdays and Fridays throughout the month and in the classroom on Mondays through uh, Wednesdays. But then the last uh, two weeks of a six week program, I think, uh, they actually are at our office full time. So that coding bridging program uh, was really quite ingenious um, and uh, the professors uh, such as Gabe and others who have worked really hard on that program the last couple of years, my hat goes off to them. It's a tremendous program. It's done a great job of uh, further prepping those students and uh, having a good working relationship with industry and UFE. Hmm. If you were to take your crystal ball and look out 10 years, 2028, where do you see the Fraser Valley, the Chilliwack tech sector, and your business? Sure. Uh, so Fraser Valley as a whole, I believe, uh, as well as many people, I'm not the only one who to voice this opinion, is that uh, tech in Vancouver has to come out to the valley. Uh, the uh, costs of being in Vancouver, of course, are so high that it's no different than why it does Silicon Valley uh, exist in the first place. Um, downtown <laughs> is expensive, coming out to the valley is the obvious uh, alternative. So I think uh, as we raise the profile of the industry here, uh, more and more tech that's in Vancouver will not be afraid to come here. If uh, it kind of is a wasteland out here or it looks like a desert to them, then it's like they don't want to be first. Uh, but as we can raise the profile of the uh, companies here and the industry as a whole, uh, it's going to look more and more attractive for them to move here. And I think once that trend starts, I think it's going to, uh, we're going to see a shift happen fairly quickly. It's going to be a slow pace of fast change uh, where we uh, certainly, uh, in hindsight, think it happened pretty darn quick. Hmm. As far as uh, Chilliwack, uh, within that uh, realm of the Valley as a whole, I believe uh, Chilliwack has a great culture here. Uh, I think uh, the community programs we have, uh, SEPCO, uh, this event, uh, the other uh, events that we've been running the last couple of years, I think we've, uh, we, we just have a, a good community attitude that I think is going to help uh, allow Chilliwack to be on the map and more visible. And therefore, I believe we're going to be able to end up with uh, more of the growth, perhaps, uh, really just as a fruit of uh, our efforts of working together. Hmm. And your company? Where do and you see company? you and your company? <laughs> sure. Uh, we definitely see the uh, SaaS solutions that we're building today uh, in their own right at the end of the day becoming their own uh, companies, actually. Um, so uh, that's exciting. Uh, definitely looking to, uh, we're definitely looking to hire people these days uh, who were able to uh, build up uh, to not just be coders, but uh, are able to take on more responsibilities as the company grows. So uh, those opportunities, of course, are important to be able to offer to your staff. Uh, and uh, more importantly, uh, I think it uh, helps uh, create, it, it keeps them here as opposed to them getting that experience in Vancouver or leaving the country altogether. We need to make sure that we actually create growth opportunities for the employees so that they see a future here for themselves. Another proposal, we've got a question. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, as well as the mic, but I'll give it a go anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Colin, so you, you talked about post-acquisition having better access, or in any case, more access to resources that you perhaps didn't have pre-acquisition. So can you tell us a little bit about how that might change, say, your customer mix, the kind of customers you might pursue, for example, and will that, mm -hmm. uh, you see that being different in the future? Yes, um, we basically are, uh, to be clear, the services side of the company, we are focused on building our new uh, SaaS solutions, which will have their own customer base that's completely different than what we have today. On the services side of the company, that is still going to grow, uh, but the services organization is, uh, of course, not able to grow as quickly as a new product company can. So on the services side, we're basically working with uh, customers today that uh, uh, honestly, uh, without the acquisition, uh, they would look at uh, the little Chilliwack tech company of so many people, and uh, it would be difficult to win that contract. Uh, so the acquisition certainly uh, 
gives us uh, more oomph uh, in the marketplace and uh, is going to allow the people who are approaching uh, for bids as well as the uh, more recent bids that we've won uh, are a result of that acquisition, giving us some more staying power and thus confidence in the potential customers and new customers. Uh, just to, because I, I guess we don't know that much yet about your, your mix uh, of customers. Are you primarily operating in Canada? Do you have international sales? Are you pursuing international mm -hmm. sales, for example? Yeah, good question. Uh, historically, it was all in Canada. Uh, we have uh, several U.S. customers now, and we do see most of our growth actually being in the U.S. And are there particular verticals or beyond equestrian, obviously, now? what You mentioned fintech. I know you're pursuing some other verticals. Can you talk sure. about that? Uh, our membership management system uh, that uh, really was the foundation with the equestrian group, of course, uh, we're looking to uh, basically make a SaaS version of that that's targeting the chambers of commerce in the U.S., as well as business improvements associations uh, in the U.S. and in Canada. So that market is an interesting one. Uh, as we've expanded our network in the U.S. of uh, business consultants uh, who we work with, who bring us clientele, uh, those business consultants uh, collectively have uh, some really good connections into the chambers. And uh, together, we've been designing uh, really a new platform that is not so much a membership management system, but actually a bit of a paradigm shift in how uh, the chambers uh, sell their memberships and what a membership even is. Good. Any other questions? Well, let's hear it for Colin. Thanks so much for your time. And thank you, Tim. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> thank you, Tim. And this will be an ongoing event, Startup Grind Chilliwack. We plan to do it monthly. We need to get together and start to put some uh, speakers on the list, but do keep involved. And, and if you liked it, invite some other folks. We'd like to grow this. So thank you. Uh, we'll still hang around and do some more networking, but you're uh, welcome. I think there's some cookies and pizza, but thank you so much.